Glory to God. I want to welcome you to another one of our lessons on Manifesting Sonship. This is where we take the time, or when we take the time, to study what does it mean to grow up in the things of God, to actually become an adult son and not just a child, a small child. The book of uh, Hebrews talks about us having been taught these things and then getting to a state where we needed to be taught again because we had returned to our infancy, needing milk <clears throat> instead of meat because we had not exercised ourselves in the knowledge of God's righteousness. And so it's, it's just in the heart of God for his children to grow up. And I take that as a personal challenge, and I'm hoping you do too, to grow up in the things of God so that he will have some adult children that he can work in and through to do what it was that he created us to do. And so we've been studying this in the uh, using the book of Ephesians chapters 4 and 5 as our base, but before we get started today I want us to do two things. First I want us to look at Luke, Luke's Gospel chapter 6 and verse 46. Luke 6, 46. And this is the Lord Jesus teaching and he asked a question here that I asked myself to answer for myself. And I'm hoping you'll do the same thing. The Lord Jesus said, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? To me that's a very profound question. You do see the question mark there. And the Lord Jesus would ask you this today. Why are we calling him Lord and not doing what he tells us to do? This goes all the way down to the foundation of our belief. When we say we confess Jesus as Lord, if we've confessed him as Lord, wouldn't we have some evidence by doing what he says to do? Evidence within ourselves. He says, do this, do this, do this. And do we do like Peter said when he said, no, Lord? The two don't go together. So now, when we look in the Word, <clears throat> this is what we're going to do. We're going to keep this scripture in mind. Because in manifesting our sonship, we're going to come up against scriptures or come up to scriptures that actually tell us what we should be doing. And if he tells us to do this and we're calling him Lord, shouldn't we do it? If he is our Lord? <coughs> See that scripture in Romans 10, 9 and, and 10, chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, where it says, And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Do we really believe that? When we confess him as Lord, are we talking to someone we believe is dead? No. We believe that he lives. We believe that he's Lord. And now we're saying we believe in our hearts. <laughs> It's not saying believe in our heads. You're going to know whether or not you're believing it in your heart because you will have a heart to do the things of God. You'll have a heart to do what the Lord tells you to do. And he's going to tell us some very mature things to do. So it says, and, and believe in your heart. So what we're going to do this hour and maybe even into the next hour, we've done this before. We're going to go through the scriptures today and we're going to do what I like to call a what if scenario. What if what we're reading in the Word is true? I mean, we, I don't think we should have to do this, but just so we don't get bogged down in 
questioning the scripture as to whether or not it's true, why can't we just look at the scriptures and we'll use this what if scenario, what if this is true? Just like it's stated, just like it's asked, just like it's commanded, what if this that we're reading is true? So we can move on. Because we can question and, and discuss every word of every scripture. But we're going to go through some scriptures and we're going to come up to a point where it tells us some things that we should do. And if it's true that we should do those, how is it going to affect our walk, our talk, our actions? Not just talking the talk, but now actually walking the walk. And that's what it tells us to walk, to live as children of light, children of God. So let's start off in our scripture in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. Now in our last lesson, the last couple of lessons actually, we've been going and starting in the same scripture, and then we've been going to scriptures relating to the fact that there are men and women in ministry, in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, that are false teachers, false apostles. Not just teachers that are ignorant of God's word and teaching error ignorantly, but those that set out to deceive purposefully. They know that they are deceiving, they are deceivers. And now, the Apostle Paul put it this, he said, why do you marvel at this? Why do we marvel? It's like a child says, oh, I can't believe anyone would do that. No, believe it, it's a warfare. There are people, if there is a war, and the object of war is to do what to the enemy? Kill them, destroy them. This is an accidental death in a war. So this is a warfare. We all agree that this spiritual warfare and we talk about it. But then when we speak about those that are warring against us, Satan has built this up in the mind of believers somehow that these people don't exist, that the only ones in the church that are teaching errors are those that are ignorant of the truths of God's word and they're doing it accidentally. A person can misspeak, a person can misunderstand or misapply the scriptures, that is true. But there are also false teachers in the church that are there and they're misleading on purpose. And the scriptures tell us why they're misleading. Now, I don't believe you as a student are misleading or have any heart to mislead the people that God places you before. God said that, that, that we shouldn't want to be uh, a teacher unless we're going to take this serious because the teacher is going to be judged at, by a different standard. And I'm believing because you're in the school, because you're taking these lessons, you're spending your time to learn the truths of God's Word, that that doesn't apply to you. But I'm also believing that there are those with a heart to do the things of God that still have not matured. This is why the Word says, don't turn this over to a novice. We need to mature in the things of God. And one of the points of maturing is to grow to the point that if your father said it and you believe that Jesus is Lord that you should act in accordance with what the word says what our Lord says what our Heavenly Father has asked us or told us to do and I don't think that's unreasonable so here in Ephesians chapter 4 <clears throat> now remember all the way through this we're going to act like we believe that the word is true. 
So in verse 14, this is why the ministry gifts were given to the church, to mature the church. And in verse 14 it says, So then we, the members of the body of Christ, as the we is being spoken of, so then we may, I'm going to read this from the Amplified Bible. So then we may no longer be children, tossed like ships, to and fro, between chance gust of teaching, and wavering with every changing wind of doctrine, the prey of the cunning and cleverness of unscrupulous men, gamblers, engaged in every shifting form of trickery and inventing errors to mislead. Inventing errors to do what? To mislead. Is that an accident? Does someone accidentally invent an error to mislead? No. These are people in the church that are teaching. It says the, the, we, the people of the church, are being tossed to and fro like ships out on the sea, just going wherever the sea takes us as if we have no one at the helm. No one's guiding the ship. <clears throat> Excuse me. Chance gust of teachings. Cleverness of what? Unscrupulous men. Where are these people? They're in the church. In the pulpits. How are you going to know who they are? By studying God's word. Now remember we said, we're going to believe this is true. If this is true, that means what? They're unscrupulous men in the church. Now, we have a couple of scriptures that we want to go to. We've been going to, <clears throat> the past two weeks we've gone over some of these scriptures over and over again. The Holy Spirit hasn't seen to it for us to move on. And so we're going to continue to go through these scriptures. We're going to go to 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 3. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3. This is from the King James Bible. It says, And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. Make what of you? Merchandise of you. This is the example we gave in our last, in our last hour. They take you over to the, this church, because we're going to visit this church, We'll take our whole congregation over to this church so that pastor can rip you off. And then two weeks from now, they'll come over to this church, our church, with their con congregation, and we'll rip off their congregation. We'll get as much money out of them as we can. What's happening? The people are being merchandised. And we act as if this, oh, that would, oh, no, they would never do that to us. <clears throat> Not only will they do it, they are doing it. It's being done. Don't get caught up in it. You're a man or woman of God, called of God to preach and teach his word, preach and teach his word. Let others know that there are false teachers and false apostles in the body of Christ. Let's look a little further. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 
17. Excuse me. It says, this is from the Amplified Bible. For we are not like so many, like hucksters, making a trade of peddling God's word. Making a what? A trade of peddling God's word. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. We are not like so many. Did it say a few? It says so many. Like hucksters making a trade of peddling God's word. I've listened to this. <clears throat> and I've seen it. I've seen people tell me. Through the medium of television where it can get to the most people. I found the secret of verse such and such. Send me a love offering of ten dollars or more and I'll send you the secret. What am I selling? I'm selling God's Word. It doesn't say for we're not like a few. How does that read in the Amplified Bible? I mean in the King James. I'm reading it from the Amplified Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. Unlike so many in the, King, in the New King James. Oh, actually, I'm sorry, that's the NIV. That's the NIV. And in the King James, it says, For we are not as many who corrupt the word of God. It doesn't say a few, church. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. And in your maturing, come to the fact of realizing this is not an accident. And this is not a few. This is not just a few. This is many that are doing this. How are you going to know the difference? By growing up, studying the Word of God to show yourself approved unto God. To show yourself to be genuine. Rightly dividing. Skillfully handling and accurately teaching the Word of Truth. The Word of God. This is not a money-making endeavor. God will see to it that your needs are met. And I'm believing that you will be just like the Apostle Paul when he wrote. He said, I have learned how to abase and I've learned how to abound. He said, I've learned to be content. Where you can learn to be content whether the money's flowing freely or things are really tight. You can learn to be content because you know that God has your back. He's your real reward. He's got your back. He knows what state you're in. And when it's all said and done, you come out victorious. You come out the victor. Let me finish reading this in the King James. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. That's not all. Let's look a little further. 2 Corinthians, that's where we are, chapter 11, verse 13. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians, chapter 11, and verse 13. 
I'm going to read it in the Amplified Bible. For such men are false apostles, spurious counterfeits, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles, special messengers of Christ the Messiah. And it is no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. So it is not surprising if his servants also masquerades as ministers of righteousness. But their ends, their end will correspond with their deeds. So you shouldn't be surprised at this. <clears throat> now don't forget our what if scenario. What if this is true? If this is true, we shouldn't be surprised at this. Isn't that right? It's a, and so it is not surprising if his servants also masquerade as ministers of righteousness. Here again, it goes right back to what is said in Hebrews, that we become babies again. And have need that one teach us again, not that we haven't been taught, which be the first principles of the teachings of Christ. The very first principles that God has made you righteous in and through Christ Jesus. So these are false apostles parading themselves or masquerading themselves as ministers of what? Righteousness. <clears throat> So that you, so that those that hear them won't accept and receive the fact that we have been made righteous. They want you to believe that your righteousness is based on your actions. And so because of their eloquence, as some of the scriptures we've seen already said, they come up with all of this plausible reasonings. I've heard it put this way more than once. You can't expect, this is a statement that false apostles, false teachers will tell you, and I have to add in those that are ignorant of the truths of God's word. So which one is it? A person that's a false teacher, a false apostle, or someone that's ignorant of God's word. Does it really matter if you have three people with a glass of arsenic? One of them is there knowing they have the arsenic. Looks just like milk. The other one is there with arsenic and they don't know what arsenic will do to a person. And the other one is there and they're ignorant of the fact that it's arsenic. Which one do you, which glass do you want to drink from? None of, them. None of them. So it doesn't matter. It's just as deadly for the false apostle, for the false teacher, or for the ignorant minister to minister to you death. Words of death. So, it, it, trying to excuse these people, giving them a, 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 an excuse for why they're killing you, to me is of, of no importance, of no use rather. It's of great importance because you don't want to drink from them. You don't want them to minister to you. And what they're ministering is death. We're in 2 Corinthians, aren't we? We're going to come back here. We're not through with that scripture. We're going to come back here. But go to chapter 3. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And we'll read in verse 6 and 7. I'm going to read this in the Amplified Bible. 
said, it is he who has qualified us, the he is being referred to as the Holy Spirit, it is he who has qualified us, making us to be fit and worthy and sufficient as minister, ministers and dispensers of a new covenant of salvation through Christ. Not ministers of the letter of legally written code, but of the Spirit. For the code of the law kills, but the Holy Spirit makes alive. The code of the law kills. Arsenic kills. The code of the law kills. It doesn't matter who's giving it to you, it kills. And what this verse is saying is the Holy Spirit has not made us killers. That we would minister death. They're not getting that if they're teaching you something that kills. They're not getting that through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It comes straight from ignorance or from Satan. And I don't want it. I don't care which one it comes from. It still kills. And I don't want to do it. I've grown up in this area. I don't want to do harm to God's children. Why would I minister death to them? Let's read verse 7. <clears throat> It says, now if the dispensation of death, engraved in letters on stone, the ministration of the law. What was engraved on stones? The Ten Commandments. So this is speaking specifically of what? The Ten Commandments. It's a ministry of death. The reason it's a ministry of death, the penalty for not keeping the Ten Commandments was death. So we've been made able ministers of a new covenant, a covenant of life in Christ Jesus, not a ministry or, uh, of death through an old covenant. He goes on to say, well, let me say this, because you'll hear this, and I've been around long enough to hear these things. Excuse me. That there are those false teachers and false apostles that will take you to this scripture, and they will say that this is talking about the Old Testament dietary laws. But when were the Old Testament dietary laws ever engraved on stone? See, they come up with these plausible arguments and reasonings. And what I started to say a few minutes ago that I've heard so many times is, you can't expect God to bless you if you're just acting any old kind of way. Doesn't that sound plausible? You're running around doing this and doing that, and just acting any old kind of way. You can't expect God to bless you, and they preach it so well. And without knowing it, you're hearing a lie. And the lie started off when, you, when it said you cannot expect God to bless you. The reason that's a lie, because God has already blessed you. And they've got you thinking that you have to get God to bless you. Meaning God lied when he said he has blessed you. I remember, we're taking this and we're studying this as if it was true. Isn't that what we're doing? Isn't that our agreement? And so, let's finish reading this. It said, but if the ministration of death written and engraven on stones, well, let me keep it in the same version, in the Amplified. Now, if the dispensation of death engraved in letters on stone, the ministration of the law was inaugurated with such glory and splendor that the Israelites were not able to look steadily 
at the face of Moses because of its brilliance, a glory that was to fade and pass away. The glory of the Old Testament was never intended to last. God used it as a tool to let man see that if they were going to live up to his standard, they would fail, even though they thought they could. Now, the day of the first Pentecost, when they were given the law, the reason they were given the law was that they boastfully said to God, we can do anything you ask us to do. Up until that point, if you read it in Exodus, they were under the grace of God, the same way we're under the grace of God now. They murmured and complained. Nothing happened to them. God blessed them all the way through. They murmured about not having water. They were given water. They murmured about not having meat. They were given meat. Murmuring is a, 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 a way of attacking God, accusing God. God did absolutely nothing to them but bless them until they made the statement, we can do anything you ask us to do. From that day on, they were under the law. And that law says, either you do it or you die. The law is good, but man wasn't. And so until this day, we're going to drop down and read one more scripture and then we're going to go back. We're going to drop down and we're going to read verse number 15. <clears throat> it says, yes, down to this very day, whenever Moses is read, that's the law, a veil lies upon their minds and hearts. The King James says, but unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their hearts. Let's go back and read verse 14. It says, for their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. This word blinded here does not mean obscure vision doesn't mean you have a problem and you need some glasses. This word blinded is a Greek word that means to indurate, which means to render stupid. Wow. So these same shysters, hucksters as the word of God says, these same teachers and ministers of death are teaching you something that is designed to render you stupid so they can get your money and get you to be their followers. Wow. It, it says it makes the mind uh, uh, become like something that has been petrified. Wow. You take a leaf that's really flexible, but when it becomes petrified, it gets hard as a rock. It's no flexibility in it, and it will break easily. It's a ministry of death. And it says this veil is still, to this day, untaken away. At the reading of what? At the of Moses. The commandments of the law. Yes. Wow. So now someone is trying to get you so that your mind is no longer flexible. It'll no longer say, well, God's word means what it says, even if I don't understand what it means. It means what it says. So we go to the Holy Spirit to let him lead us. That's why it says, says it is he who has qualified us. He, the Holy Spirit, has qualified us, making us to be fit and worthy and sufficient as ministers and dispensers of a new covenant. A new covenant. So ask yourself the question the next time you hear it. 
Why are these people that you hear running back to the Old Testament? When the Holy Spirit has made the ministers of today ministers of a new covenant. Who qualified them to minister the Old Covenant? It wasn't the Holy Spirit. In fact, the Holy Spirit had a group that were qualified to minister the Old Covenant. They were of the Levitical priesthood. And if you're not a member of the Levitical priesthood, I have to ask you the question, who has qualified you to be a minister of the Old Covenant? I know who qualifies the ministers of the New Covenant. The Holy Spirit does. How do you know that? Remember we said we're taking this as if it was true. And it says here that the Holy Spirit has qualified us and made us ministers of the New Covenant. Ask yourself the question, why am I wanting to minister the Old Covenant? When we have a new covenant, a better covenant, based on better promises, why is someone taking you, or why do you want to take someone back to the lesser when you have the greater? There is nothing in the old covenant that is better than what we have in the new covenant. Let me put it this way, there's nothing better than Jesus. And we have Jesus. Now you give me something out of that old covenant that's better than Jesus. You can't do it. I don't care who you are. You can not do it. We have the best. And we've been instructed by the Holy Spirit to minister to the best. Well, we've been here many times in this, the different courses. Let's go back to looking at these false apostles and false teachers. I want you to know that this is not accidental and it's not an obscure scripture that we're going to. You want to have a sure foundation that when you go forward ministering the new covenant, that you're ministering it under the anointing and unction of the Holy Spirit. And that you're ministering truth and you're ministering life, not death. You're ministering the gospel of grace, not law. So we were in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 through 15. I'll read it again from the Amplified Bible. For such men are false apostles, spurious counterfeits, deceitful workers or workmen, masquerading as apostles, special messengers of Christ the Messiah. And it is no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. So it is not surprising. I know the King James says, so no marvel. Why do we marvel at this? You're in a warfare. The most damage that the enemy can do is by getting in the positions of leadership. To lead you astray and to get you to lead others astray. Hoping that you won't study and see the truth of God's word, that you'll believe their words and that you will go out and spread their words and profess to be a disciple of this one or a disciple of that one, bragging about having this one as your spiritual head or having that one as your spiritual head. And this is all opposed to the Word of God. What chapter are we in? We're in chapter 11. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, 
Let's see. Yeah. We'll start reading in verse 18. We came over here for a specific reason relating to this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll start reading in verse 18. It says, Let no man deceive. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. We're going to read 18 through 23. It says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. This is why we came over here, verse 21. Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, let's stop right there. It says, let no man glory in men, saying, this one is my leader. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas. Let no one glory in men, saying, I'm of Pastor Stewart. It says, don't glory in men. And the false apostles, that's what they want you to do, is glory in them. And promote them. That this is, oh, he's so and so, he's this, he's that. It says, let no man glory in men. It's pretty plain, isn't it? And who is he talking about? The leaders of the church. It says, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death. Well, let me read that 21st verse in the Amplified Bible. So you see, I'm not adding to this. It says, Let no one exalt proudly concerning men, boasting of having this or that man as a leader. Is that pretty plain? For all things are yours. This is the beauty of the new covenant. All things are yours. It doesn't matter about God going to give us something based on our actions because he has already given us everything based on the actions of Jesus. This is why it's a gospel of grace. This is why it's good news. It's not based on us. It's not based on the law. It's not based on us having this one or that one as a leader. It's not based on us being good. Or not based on our not being bad. We've been made righteous in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. If we're going to boast, it says, let your boast be in the Lord. Don't let men deceive you, and don't you be a deceiver of men, trying to get men to be good. So if I tell them this and tell them that, if I can get them to stop doing this or get them to stop doing that, you can't. The law couldn't. If you could, then God would have sacrificed Jesus for you for nothing. Jesus died for us because we had not the ability in our fallen state to live for God. Since we couldn't live for God, Jesus died for us so that in Christ Jesus, we have been made alive and we have been made righteous. So when anyone is telling you that things are happening to you because of this or because of that, because of good karma and bad karma, because of what you sowed, you have to reap. It's a law. Sowing and reaping is a law. And what we sowed, Jesus reaped. Wow. 
Sowing and reaping is a law. We sow death and Jesus reaped death for us. This is the new covenant based on better promises and all of them are in Christ Jesus. All of these better promises. Let's go back. Let's go a little further. I wanted us to get to Titus chapter 1 verse 10. Titus chapter 1 verse 10 we'll read verse 10 and 11 here again this is from the Amplified Bible for there are many there's that word many again there are many disorderly and unruly men who are idle, vain empty and misleading talkers and self deceivers and deceivers of others this is true especially of those of the circumcision party who have come over from Judaism. Their mouths must be stopped for they are mentally distressing and subverting whole families by teaching what they ought not to teach for the purpose of getting base advantage and disreputable gain. Are we looking at this as though it's true? Are you still with me? If you're still with me, then you know there, there are many. There are many disorderly and unruly men. Verse 11 is so awesome. It says, Their mouths must be stopped for they are mentally distressing and subverting whole families. teaching them what they ought not to teach. What is it they ought not to teach? They ought not to teach a righteousness based on works. And it says they're subverting whole families. It didn't just say the head of the family. It didn't just say the children of the family. It didn't just say the mother of the family. It said the whole family is following after them. Instead of living and growing in the things of God, growing to the maturity that we've been studying that God wants us to grow to so that we'd be no more children tossed to and fro, these families are being subverted. They're being made victims. Let's read a little more. Galatians chapter 4 verse 17. <clears throat> By now, you should be getting the feeling that God wants us to know and to grow up and understand that we're in a battle, we're in a warfare, there are enemies in the camp. Where did I say? Galatians chapter 4, verse 17. Amplified Bible says, These men, these Judaizing teachers, are zealously trying to dazzle you, paying court to you, making much of you. But their purpose is not honorable, or worthy, or for any good. What they want to do is to isolate you from us who oppose them, so that they may win you over to their size, to their side, and get you to court their favor get you to kiss their ring, get you to honor them. Not the Lord Jesus, not the Word of God, but to be their followers, to be their disciples. Let's look a little further. 
Now, you're watching this on video, you have time to meditate on these scriptures. You have time to check these scriptures out. You have time to check the references for these scriptures. You have time to read these scriptures in different translations of the Bible. You can take your concordance, you can study every word in the scriptures. You can find out if the scriptures are meaning what it appears to be that they're meaning when we read them. Philippians chapter 3 verse 2. This is also from the Amplified Bible. It says, Look out for those dogs, Judaizers, legalists. Look out for those mischief makers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Mutilate the flesh. Because you should be watching out, you should be looking out for these people. You should be listening. You should be looking to see what are they doing, what are their actions, says you'll know them by their fruit. And that doesn't mean that they're great because they have a nice fine car. Because they've been welcomed by the president. Because they have a multi-million dollar edifice. None of those things are anything in the eyes of God. That doesn't impress God. And it should not impress you. There's nothing wrong with having any of those things, but what should impress you is what's coming out of their mouth, and what should be coming out of their mouth is the ministry of the New Testament, a ministry of the gospel of peace, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of grace, the gospel of the kingdom of God. Not because they dress well and they wear expensive clothes and wear a lot of jewelry. There's nothing wrong with those things. Did you hear me say that? It is nothing wrong with those things, but that should not be the standard that you use to let these people pour words into your ears. Because if they're not words of grace, they're words of death. And we're coming down to the end of our time. So let's close on a note that relates to our first scripture. Turn to Ephesians chapter 3. I'm going to go back one chapter and show you where we're headed when we grow up. Ephesians chapter 3. <clears throat> And this is what the Lord wants us to grow up to. Verse 17. Well, we'll start reading verse 14. It says, For this cause I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. And I'm going to stop it right there, although the sentence doesn't stop. That's where we're headed. That's what God wants us to grow up into. That we would be rooted and grounded in love. And as we continue, in our study of Ephesians, as we continue on to chapter, to, in chapter 4, verse 15 and on, we will see that God's purpose in setting the gifts in the church, and the purpose for us growing up, is so that we could walk in love. And then, that's when you start to realize that God has told us to do things, that Jesus has told us to do things as his disciples. And you'll have to ask yourself the question that Jesus asked, if we call him Lord, why is it 
we aren't doing the things he asked us to do. Well, I'm believing that what we're going to find out is the reason we haven't done them is number one, we didn't know about them, and number two, we just had not matured to the state that we're maturing to now as we continue to grow and manifest our sonship in Christ Jesus. Well, until our next time together, this is Pastor Stewart signing off. Glory.